Module 4, Performance Outcome Area 2. Hello, my name is Rebecca Sparkman, and I work at the International Monetary Fund. Welcome to Module 4. In the previous module, you learned about one of the core performance outcome areas of a tax administration, one that ensures both that the taxpayer registration database is complete and accurate, and that efforts are made by the tax administration to identify and register unregistered businesses. This module is about performance outcome area two, or POA two, which involves effective risk management. At the conclusion of module four, you'll be able to perform your task as a TADAT assessor for POA two, both professionally and objectively. We have five objectives in module four. First, be able to evaluate a tax administration's performance with respect to how it is able to identify potential risk assess their importance and rank them, as well as to find out what efforts are made to mitigate the risk. Second, learn about international good practice in risk management and tax administration. Third, know that indicators and dimensions are used to measure the performance of a tax administration in using risk management. Fourth, learn the criteria that will help you score the indicators and dimensions for this POA. Fifth, as in the previous module, learn what evidence you should gather and what questions you should ask to be able to conduct an objective assessment of POA 2. Now, in the following slide, let's look at what the desired outcome is for POA 2. We'll also examine the basis on which risk management is founded. The desired outcome of POA 2 is that the risk to revenue and tax administration operations are identified and managed effectively. As you know, tax administrations face numerous compliance and institutional risks that could adversely affect revenue and tax operations. So what are the international good practices in this area? Managing compliance and institutional risk that affect the entire organization requires a wide range of structured approaches that are an integral part of multi-year strategic and annual operational planning. It implies both identifying risk and finding and mitigating measures to address them. We'll discuss the international good practices in managing compliance and institutional risk in the following slides. Now let's look at good practices in the compliance risk management, which include the following. A structured and multi-year approach to compliance risk. Identification, assessment, ranking, and quantification of risk. Compliance risk structured around taxpayer segments, taxpayer obligations, and core taxes. Intelligence gathering and research to identify compliance levels and risk. Analysis of tax audits and tax declarations that provide insights into areas where taxpayers do not understand the requirements of the law, are prone to making errors, or are inclined not to comply, for example, by failing to report income. Analysis of the environmental scanning. Use of third-party information, for example, from banks, credit card providers, online vendors, stock exchanges, customs, and other government agencies such as anti-money laundering bodies and registrars of land and property ownership. Studies into hidden economic activity of businesses and tax compliance gap analysis. Looking at taxpayer behavior and attitudes toward paying taxes as well as research on topical compliance issues internationally, such as potential revenue losses from transfer pricing and other forms of profit shifting by taxpayers with cross-border operations, and aggressive tax planning, especially by high wealth and high income individuals. Management of major risk via development and implementation of a compliance improvement plan. Evaluation of effectiveness of a major mitigation activities as feedback for future planning. Let us look at the common features of a compliance improvement plan. Box 2 includes common features of a compliance improvement plan. A typical compliance improvement plan brings together, generally in a single document, a description of the most significant compliance risk identified in the tax system and explains how the tax administration intends to respond to the risk, focuses on core taxes and key tax obligations, is structured around the following. 
taxpayer segments, such as individuals, micro and small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, nonprofit organizations, government organizations, and high wealth and high income individuals. Other parameters, including type of tax, industry sector, and geographic region. The plan summarizes for each taxpayer segment, the economic revenue and business environment. For example, number of taxpayers, nature of entities, role of intermediaries, and tax revenue contribution. It outlines headline compliance issues and segment-specific risk. Headline issues are those that have an effect across two or more segments and include, for example, international profit shifting and use of tax havens. It describes the risk mitigation strategies and actions to be taken. These strategies focus on the underlying drivers of causes, not symptoms, of noncompliance and encompasses a mix of responses including taxpayer education and assistance, improvements to laws and procedures, audits, and other forms of enforcement. Explains the process to be used to monitor and evaluate the effects of the risk mitigation activities. For TADAP purposes, institutional risk is divided into two components. Operational risk refers to actions or events that affect or destroy part or all of the administration's systems, processes, assets or resources such as buildings, IT, equipment, workforce processes, data, and records. Human capital risk refers to the inability to maximize the tax administration's effectiveness on account of absence of capability, capacity, compliance, cost and connection, or engagement gaps of and by its employees. Now let's look at five international good practices in institutional risk management. First, a tax administration should have a risk register with the framework of problems threatening business continuity. It should also have a plan for continuity of tax operations in the event of a disaster, such as a fire or earthquake. Second, the tax administration should have an assessment of the likelihood and consequences of natural disasters or disruptive human-caused or human-impacted calamities. Third, it should outline the steps in the event of a disaster to maintain business continuity. Fourth, it is important to have an extremely well-trained staff in case of a disaster in order to be able to recover procedures quickly. And fifth, a tax administration should have preventative measures and internal controls to protect tax administration systems from fraud and error. That last practice is a very important point that will be further analyzed in POA 9. POA 9 will also analyze the importance of having an effective internal and external oversight to detect and deter undesirable events. For operational risk, it is critical to have a risk register, a central repository of identified institutional risk, that potentially pose a threat to the continuity of tax administration operations. Risk registers may vary from organization to organization, but typically include, at a minimum, the following information. Short description of the risk. Date identified. Likelihood of occurrence. Severity of effect. Mitigation measures. Name of risk owner the person responsible for ensuring that the risk is addressed, and risk status. Have a plan for continuity of a tax administration operations in the event of a disaster that destroys part or all of the administration's assets and resources, including human resources, buildings, IT and other equipment, data, and other records. Plans of this kind commonly referred to as a business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan, typically assess the likelihood and consequences of natural disasters, such as flood, fire, earthquake, and pandemic, and human-caused events, such as sabotage, theft, civil unrest, and internal fraud. 
It describes and outlines steps to be taken in the event of a disaster so the administration can maintain revenue collections, provide taxpayer services, ensure safety of staff members and taxpayers, and preserve confidentiality of tax records. It trains staff members in disaster recovery procedures, for example, through disaster simulation exercises. It takes preventative measures, for example, off-site backup of data, and implementing internal controls to protect tax administration systems from fraud and error, covered in detail in POA 9. It will have effective internal and external oversight to detect and deter unwanted events. You'll see more of this in POA 9. Now let's look at steps to address operational risk. Box 3 includes steps to address operational risk. 1. Program initiation and management. Senior executives undertake the following. 1. Develop an understanding of why an operational risk management program is needed. 2. Agree on crisis recovery priorities. And 3. Provide adequate funding for operational risk management. 2. Risk evaluation and control risk to the tax administration's operations are identified. Their likelihood and consequence of occurrence is estimated. 3. Business impact analysis. A business impact analysis study is conducted to determine the impact of the identified risk, the recovery time objective, and recovery point objective. Four, business continuity strategies. Identify mitigation strategies for the operational risk in line with the determined recovery time objective and recovery point objective. In addition, cost-benefit analysis is conducted. 5. Plan implementation and documentation. Design, develop, and implement the strategies that have been approved. The plan should reflect the previously approved strategies that address the analysis from the risk assessment and the business impact analysis. 6. Training and awareness programs. The business continuity plan is established and published. The tax administration creates awareness for the plan and staff are trained in the approved business continuity procedures, for example, through simulation exercises. Seven, emergency response and operations. Situations that potentially threaten the safety of the tax administration's employees, visitors or assets are assessed to determine how each occurrence will be handled in the time between when an incident begins and the time when the responders arrive. Eight, monitoring, audit, and management review. Monitor, audit, and review the implementation of the operational risk implementation program. Let's look at the key human capital risk elements, or the five Cs. Box four includes key capital risk elements. A typical human capital risk framework will have the following category of risk. Risk category one, capability description of key risk, the extent to which the tax administration, number one, assesses the gap between existing workforce skills, competencies, and business needs. Two, scans the labor market and competes for skills critical to its operations. Three, leverages outsourcing methods and use of non-permanent workers. Four, recruits top talent, people with the most in-demand skills. Five, identifies and retains key people. Six, facilitates the development of skills, training tax administration officials in the core business of tax or capabilities required by the business in the near future. Risk category two, capacity description of key risk, the extent to which the tax administration. Seven, implements a succession planning framework to develop future managers and leaders. Eight, mentors and prepares internal candidates to assume critical leadership, managerial and operational roles. Nine, promotes workforce diversity and inclusion that is benchmarked against documented and binding national or international norms and values. Risk category three, compliance description of key risk, the extent to which the tax administration, 10, 
ensures through regular evaluation that performance management or talent reviews are conducted objectively and taken as a critical input into business objectives. 11. Ensures compliance with national laws and regulations governing employer-employee relationships, including those applying to employee unionization. 12. Ensures that the organization's policies are applied uniformly to all employees. 13. Ensures that the organization adheres to national laws and regulations governing workplace health and safety security conditions. Risk Category 4. Cost description of key risk. The extent to which the tax administration, 14, ensures affordability of the workforce by minimizing risk taking and compensation arrangements. 15, analyzes the impact, including cost to productivity and service delivery, of attrition and the loss of critical knowledge. 16, aligns remuneration with performance. 17, uses analytical tools to take a long-term and informed view of workforce cost and linkages between a defined set of human capital risk. 18, plans for and provides sufficient resources to manage and developing talent. Risk category five, connection description of key risk, the extent to which the tax administration, 19, promotes employee management and motivation, including the free flow of ideas for purposes of innovation and improved productivity, and creating an environment of openness and trust. 20. Identifies, leverages, and through select assignments, shares talent and skills across the organization. There are five high-level indicators encompassing eight dimensions for the POA about risk management, POA 2. Let's discuss the five high-level indicators for POA2. The first one is P23, about the identification, assessment, ranking, and quantification of compliance risk. The second is P24, about mitigation of risk through compliance improvement plans. The third is P25, about the monitoring and evaluation of compliance and risk mitigation activities. The fourth is P26, about the management of operational risk. And the fifth is P27, about the management of human capital risk. Now let's take a look at the dimensions. P23 has two dimensions. The first dimension is the extent of intelligence gathering and research to identify compliance risk. And the second dimension is the process used to assess, rank, and quantify compliance risk. P24 has only one dimension, the degree to which risks are mitigated through a compliance improvement plan. P25 also has only one dimension, the process to monitor and evaluate the impact of compliance risk mitigation activities. P26 has two dimensions. The first dimension looks at the process used to identify, assess, and mitigate operational risk. And the second dimension is the extent to which the effectiveness of the business continuity program is tested, monitored, and evaluated. And finally, P27 has two dimensions. The extent to which the tax administration has in place the capacity and structures to manage human capital risk. And the second dimension, the degree to which the tax administration evaluates the status of human capital risk and related mitigation interventions. Now let's go to each indicator one by one. How do we score the first dimension about indication of risk? Remember, indicator P23 has two dimensions. One is about the extent of intelligence gathering and research for identification of risk, and the other it is about the process used for assessing, ranking, and quantifying compliance risk. In this case, the overall score of the indicator P23 is based on the M1 method, that is, the weaker of the scores of the two dimensions. If, for instance, the score for identification is a C and the score for assessment, ranking, and quantification is an A, the overall score for P23 will be a C which is the weaker of the two. 
Let's look at the dimension P231 about identification. Because a score of A represents good practice, a tax administration can get an A score if it accomplishes all of the following good practices. Intelligence gathering and research to identify compliance levels and risk. Analysis of environmental scanning as part of multi-year strategic planning. Analysis of third-party information from a range of external sources. For example, external studies into taxpayer behavior and attitude to compliance, as well as research on topical compliance issues, such as transfer pricing or high-wealth individuals. Research into hidden activities of businesses is very important. For example, in relation to the registration of taxpayers so the assessor can know who is not in the tax net. Analysis of internal source data, such as audit results and tax declarations. Tax compliance gap studies, for example, a VAT gap analysis. For a B score, a tax administration will have analysis of environmental scanning as part of multi-year strategic planning and analysis of internal source data we just saw for the A score, except that an analysis of external source information is not required. For a C score, the tax administration has a less comprehensive analysis of third-party information and is mostly limited to internal data sources. All of the remaining practices need to be present to get a C score. And a D score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Now let's look at how we score the second dimension, which is about assessment, ranking, and quantification of risk. A tax administration will get an A score if the following requirements are met. A structured risk assessment process that is based on good practice is in place. The tax administration assesses and prioritizes risk for all core taxes. For example, the personal income tax, the corporate income tax, the VAT, domestic excise taxes, and the PAYE. It assesses taxpayer obligations as well. For example, registration, filing, payment, and reporting. And this process of the assessment is part of the multi-year strategic planning. For a B score, the tax administration will meet all the requirements for an A, except that the risk assessment process is not part of a multi-year strategic planning process and covers at least one major economic sector. The process is, however, linked to the tax administration's broader annual business planning. Score C is given to a tax administration that it has a less structured risk assessment process in place to assess and prioritize compliance risk for all core taxes and the four main compliance obligations. And a D score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Now let's discuss how the indicator or mitigation of risk is scored. Remember, indicator P24 has only one dimension, which measures the degree to which the tax administration mitigates assessed risk to the tax system through compliance improvement programs. Because this is a single dimension indicator, the dimension score becomes the indicator score. For an A score, the tax administration needs to have a documented compliance improvement program that covers the following. All identified high risk, for example, transfer pricing risk or risk related to the hidden economy. All core taxes, such as the corporate income tax, the personal income tax, the VAT, the domestic excise taxes, and the PAYE. These are the core taxes assessed by the TEDAT. The four main taxpayer obligations, which, as we just saw, are registration, filing payment, and reporting. All key taxpayer segments, the large taxpayer segment, the medium-sized and small taxpayer segment, and even the non-business individual. And finally, the A-score Compliance Improvement Program should be fully resourced and the progress should be monitored monthly. For a B-score, 
the Tax Administration will have a compliance improvement plan that has mitigation activities in respect of all identified high risk that cover all core taxes and the four taxpayer obligations. However, the compliance program will only cover the large taxpayer segment. And finally, as in the A-score, the Compliance Improvement Program should be fully resourced and the progress should be monitored monthly. For a C-score, the Compliance Program does not cover all core taxes and does not cover all four main taxpayer obligations. It does not assess all taxpayer segments and instead of monitoring the Compliance Improvement Pro Program monthly, the administration monitors, for example, every three months. And a D score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Let's look how we score the indicator about monitoring and evaluating the effect of risk mitigating activities. Indicator P25 has only one dimension, which examines the processes used for monitoring and evaluating risk mitigation actions. Because this is a single dimension indicator, the dimension score becomes the indicator score. For an A score, the tax administration will need to have a risk management committee that is at the senior management level and plays an active role in approving risk mitigation strategies. This risk management committee monitors the progress of implementation of the mitigation activities and the evaluation of the effectiveness of all approved compliance risk mitigation activities is documented. It is very important to have documentation for all the risk mitigation activities. And finally, senior management reviews the evaluation. For a B-score, formal governance arrangements are in place at senior management level that plays an active role in approving risk mitigation strategies and monitor the progress with implementation of the mitigation activities. The evaluation of the effectiveness happens for at least half of the approved compliance risk mitigation activities. Remember that for an A score, all of the approved compliance risk mitigation activities need to be documented. For a C score, the tax administration operates on a more ad hoc basis. It is not as structured as the A and B scores. And again, a D score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Finally, let's move from compliance risk relative to taxpayers to operational risk within the tax agency. Institutional risk include, for example, IT systems failure, loss of confidential data, cybersecurity attacks, asset destruction, such as from a fire or an earthquake, and business interruptions. Let's see how the indicator on management of operational risk is scored. The first dimension looks at the process used to identify, assess, and mitigate operational risk. The second dimension involves the extent to which the effectiveness of the business continuity program is tested, monitored, and evaluated. Let's take a look at P261 and how a tax administration identifies, assesses, and mitigates operational risk. For an A score, a tax administration has a structured process applied annually to identify, assess, prioritize, and document or register identified operational risk, including cybersecurity across the whole organization. It conducts a business impact analysis and explicitly matches operational risk to organizational performance annually. The recovery time objective and response point objective are determined, documented, and strategies and activities are identified to address both. Senior management formally endorses and implements the operational business continuity plan that clearly articulates risk appetite, tolerance by risk category, and is in line with the strategies adopted and the risk identified for all operational risk. All staff members are trained and tested on operational risk roles and responsibilities at least once a year. Business continuity exercises are conducted every six months and the results documented. For a B-score, 
a structured process is applied and a business impact analysis is conducted every two years. The recovery time objective and response point objective are determined, documented, and strategies and activities are identified to address both. Senior management formally endorses and implements the operational business continuity plan that clearly articulates risk appetite, tolerance by risk category, and is in line with the strategies adopted and the risk identified for all operational risk. At least 50% are trained and tested about operational risk, and business continuity exercises are conducted at least once a year. For the C-score, a structured process is applied, and a business impact analysis is conducted every two years, but it's associated mainly with the ICT systems. In addition, a well-defined business continuity plan is implemented in line with the strategies adopted and the risk for ICT systems. Business continuity exercises for all ICT dedicated staff are conducted at least once in the last two years including fire drills and ICT-specific business continuity exercises, and the results documented. And a D-score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Let's now look at how we score the second dimension, P262, the extent to which the effectiveness of the business continuity program is tested, monitored, and evaluated. A country's tax administration can get an A score if all the following are present. Senior management monitors implementation progress of the business continuity program at least twice annually and takes corrective action. Its effectiveness is tested and audited internally annually and once every three years by external auditors against international risk management standards, such as ISO 22301 and ISO 31000, or equivalent national or internal standards. Senior management team reviews the implementation progress and effectiveness of the business continuity program, and test results are used to update the business continuity program. For a B score, senior management monitors implementation progress of the business continuity program at least once annually and takes corrective action. Its effectiveness is tested and audited internally annually and once every two years by internal auditors against international risk management standards, such as ISO 22301 and ISO 31000, or equivalent national or internal standards. Senior management team reviews the implementation progress and effectiveness of the business continuity program and test results are used to update the business continuity program. For a C-score, senior management monitors implementation progress of the business continuity program and takes related corrective actions on an ad hoc basis, and the business continuity program effectiveness is tested and audited by either internal or external auditors against international risk management standards, such as ISO 22301, and ISO 31000, or equivalent national or internal standards. Senior management team reviews the implementation progress and effectiveness of the business continuity program, and test results are used to update the business continuity program. Now let's see how P27, the indicator about management of human capital risk, is scored. The first dimension looks at the extent to which the tax administration has in place the capacity and structures to manage human capital risk. The second dimension involves the degree to which the tax administration evaluates the status of human capital risk and related mitigation interventions. Let's now look at P271 and the capacity and structures of the tax administration to manage human capital risk. For an A score, the following must exist. A formal process to identify, assess, prioritize, and mitigate human capital risk. At least two persons in human resource management with human resources risk training, understanding, and experience. A formal process to train staff members at the strategic and tactical levels 
about human resource risk and their potential effect on operations. A governance structure that reviews human capital risk, HCR, and mitigating measures every six months. Independent third-party review of human resource, HR, operations and systems every five years. And staff members' agreement on performance expectations that they discuss with their line managers twice a year. For a B-score, the following exist. A formal process to identify, assess, prioritize, and mitigate human capital risk. There is no human resource management staff member with human resources risk training, understanding, and experience. And a governance structure is in place and its governing board reviews human resource risk issues and mitigating measures annually. And an independent third-party review of HR operations and systems occurs every seven years. For a C-score, a formal process to identify, assess, prioritize, and mitigate human capital risk and mitigating measures occurs annually. And an independent third-party review of HR operations and systems occurs every seven years. And a D-score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Now let's look at how we score the second dimension for P27 and the extent to which the effectiveness of the business continuity program is tested, monitored, and evaluated. Remember that a score of A represents international good practice. A country's tax administration can get an A score if all the following are present. Persons independent of the HR function formally evaluate human capital risk status once a year and cover at least one risk across the five categories in box four, the five C's, and any 11 other human capital risk for a total of 16. An annual impact analysis conducted by competent persons who are independent of the HR function. They evaluate the efficacy of risk mitigating interventions. The annual operations report contains a section that deals with human capital risk and the content mirrors results of the formal assessment. For a B score, the following are present. Persons independent of HR function normally evaluate human capital risk status once a year and cover at least one risk across the five categories in box four, the five C's, and any seven other human capital risk for a total of 12. An annual impact analysis is conducted by competent persons who are independent of the HR function. They evaluate the efficacy of risk mitigating interventions. The annual operations report contains a section that deals with human capital risk and the content mirrors results of the formal assessment. For a C-score, the following are present. Persons independent of HR function formally evaluate human capital risk status once a year and cover at least one risk across the five categories in box four, the five C's, and any four other human capital risk for a total of nine. An annual impact analysis is conducted by competent persons who are independent of the HR function, who evaluate the efficacy of risk mitigating interventions. The annual operations report contains a section that deals with human capital risk and the content mirrors the results of the formal assessment. And a D-score is given when the requirements for a C rating or higher are not met. Now that you know the criteria for scoring the different dimensions and indicators for POA2, let's look at the information we need to gather during the assessment. I encourage you to review Table 8 of the Field Guide for a detailed checklist of questions to ask the tax authorities and for examples of the documents and other evidence you will need to guide you in the information gathering process and field interviews related to POA2. Some of the information can be requested from the tax authority in advance in the pre-mission phase or can be researched from websites. Other evidence and information will need to be observed during the in-country mission or discussed during the interviews with the tax officials in the country. Adequate information is essential for POA2. When you perform your job as a POA2 assessor, you should ask the following core questions. Now, I know it's a long list, but please bear with me. 
What unit of the tax administration is responsible for setting risk management policy and overseeing its implementation? Does the tax administration gather intelligence and conduct research to understand compliance clients' levels and risk in respect to core taxes, taxpayer segments, and key tax obligations? What are the examples of this activity? Does the tax administration have a structured process to assess and prioritize compliance risk? Does it cover all taxpayers and all taxpayer segments? Does the risk assessment and prioritization fit into the multi-year or annual planning process? Does the tax administration make estimates of revenue lost in core taxes as a result of non-compliance overall and in specific sectors? And how regularly are those estimates made? Are they published? Is the methodology robust? Does the tax administration have a compliance improvement program to mitigate the effects of identified risk? If so, does it cover all taxes, all taxpayer segments, and the four compliance obligations of a taxpayer? Is there a recent impact analysis of mitigation measures about revenue collections and taxpayer compliance behavior of quantified tax? Does the tax administration regularly alert policymakers about loopholes in the law that expose the tax system to high levels of risk? Does this tax administration have a structured process in place to identify, assess, prioritize, prevent, and mitigate operational risks, such as the risk of IT system failure, cybersecurity breach, and, lo and loss of taxpayer data? If yes, does the process form part of the tax administration's planning process so that inter institutional risks are mitigated? Is the business continuity management program tested and audited? Are the results and recommendations documented, reviewed, and acted on by senior management? Does the tax administration have in place the capacity and structures to manage capital risk and human capital risk? If yes, does the tax administration evaluate the status of human capital risk and related mitigation interventions? And if yes, does the process form part of the tax administration's planning process so that institutional risks are mitigated? Now, we need to be Sherlock Holmes and gather evidence. Without evidence, we can't score, right? So what sources of information should one use for gathering evidence? Your main sources for gathering information about risk management will be documentation in respect to the different types of initiatives to identify assets and quantify the risk. Some of the sources of evidence include tax gap studies, studies about transfer pricing, hidden economy, and behavioral studies, documentation of risk management and methodology used by the tax administration, organizational charts about the tax administration and role descriptions of the main organizational units involved in risk management. A documented list of identified compliance risks for each taxpayer segment or subsegment. Documentation showing how identified risks have been assessed, quantified, and prioritized. Documented methodology to estimate tax revenue lost in different sectors and segments as a result of non-compliance. Documented estimates and published reports about tax revenue leakage in spe specific areas of non-compliance. Documented multi-year or annual compliance improvement programs and progress reports. Documented evaluation reports about the compliance effect of the main risk mitigation activities undertaken during the past one or two years. Documented processes for feeding compliance impact findings into the development of future compliance programs. Now that you've studied the detailed methodology for POA2, you should be able to conduct assessments for this outcome area. You've learned about the good practices in risk management, a core performance area for tax administrations. You've seen what the indicators and the dimensions are for judging the quality of risk management. 
including having the ability to identify potential risk, assess their importance, rank them, and undertake measures to mitigate the risk. You've learned how the indicators and dimensions are scored, and you know what to look for to gather evidence for scoring, including whom to ask and where to find useful information. Congratulations, you did a great job. I hope you have enjoyed our journey through module four. It was a pleasure talking to you about risk management. I'm sure you're becoming a very effective and competent POA assessor. Now you are all set to move to POA 3, which is discussed in module 5. Good luck. <laughs>